Hi, I'm Kate Fitzgerald, Associate Hack, introducing this special episode on women in learning. Here's the news. Research shows female L&D professionals face serious obstacles to career progress. Gender imbalances in learning have actually worsened since 2015. Meanwhile, the global pandemic is disproportionately affecting women, forcing many to consider leaving the job market altogether. Welcome to The Learning Hack, a podcast about the people and technologies that are creating the future of learning. I'm John Helmer. Now, guess what? Learning is cool. Learning is cool. If I said to you that there was a set of apparently intractable issues negatively affecting progress in the careers of not just a minority but a sizable majority of learning professionals, it might get your attention. If I then told you that under our noses the situation has been getting worse over recent years and now the pandemic is giving it an extra, even more savage twist, you might start to feel that there was some urgency to knowing more about this. Here's the facts. Women join the learning profession at two or three times the rate of men. However, by the time you get to executive and leadership levels, that waiting flips and men predominate. And the problem hasn't improved in recent years. Listen to our guest, Sharon claffey Kaliubi, who started tracking this data back in 2015. In 2018, we got the numbers and um, they got worse. This year, working women across a vast swathe of sectors and professions, as well as those in learning, are facing a heightened level of threat to their career progression due to the pandemic. They're calling it the she session. Coronavirus could set women's economic progress back half a century, according to institutions like the UN and the World Economic Forum widening pay gaps and other structural inequalities worldwide. And on the home front, women are far more likely to have lost their jobs than men during the first wave. And those who still do have jobs find the burden of childcare, homeschooling and extra housework so unsustainable as the crisis carries on that many are forced to give up paid work altogether. So what can we do in our part of the forest at least? Our guest this time has some really good ideas about that. Sharon claffey Kaliubi is a multi-award winning learning professional and co-founder with Kate Graham of the Hashtag Women in Learning group. She's held high profile executive roles in L&D with the likes of Thomson Reuters and Enterprise Ireland. And prior to her current role as VP North America for Learning Pool, was a learning fellow and advisor for Elliot Maisie and before that head of global learning and development for State Street Global Advisors in Boston, Massachusetts. I caught up with Sharon in Boston. I wanted to know how any professional faced with such a battery of oppositional forces can find the motivation and the means to carry on. But what I found was a huge reserve of optimism, creativity and a relentless energy. Sharon isn't just carrying on, she's surging ahead. So welcome to The Learning Hack, Sharon. It's clear we've got no problem attracting women to take up careers in learning. They're all over the place. They've all got three names. They're joining the profession at two or three times the rate of men. But then you look at executive positions, the numbers flip round, and men outnumber women two or three to one. So what's going on there? Is it a glass ceiling or is the problem happening lower down, maybe on the stairs? And what should we do about it? And what do we put it down to? Well, that's a great question, John. Um... I love that you use the analogy, is it a ceiling or the stairs? Um, And conversations about this phenomenon where so many, uh, mostly women, even in top of the class, I don't know where the men are coming in, just get outnumbered when it comes to those senior C-suite level roles. We've had a lot of conversations and Mandy Christensen from Chewy, I think mentioned this really well, is we need to send the elevator down to help develop the other women to come up. And there's research on this. And many times there's only room for, say, one female executive role. And I feel that part of the problem stays with women in regard to why we're not bringing more up. We're not providing more role models. We're not developing. And I think when we did the last conversation on this, it might have been Barbara Thompson that said, the elevator can go sideways. It can go down. It can go diagonal. So uh, there is an issue with women not getting those roles, the C-suite, and that's in business. But it shouldn't be at the numbers it's at in learning because our numbers coming in, two to three women 
to every one guy. And yet we have two to three men leading learning organizations to every one woman. So I see that as a big stumbling block. And I would love to see those stats and numbers shift as we evolve and keep the conversation going from panels to more of us getting off the panel and coming down and working and we're now making these more workshops we're giving tactics and strategies and I'm hoping to see the needle move in the next year or two if if, if we keep this up we've been starting me personally this conversation since 2013 Elliot Macy started it in about I believe 2011 and it's just kind of carried over it hit Europe um, I think learning technologies in 2015 so we, we got to mm. go at some point we got to shift this yeah, I, I noticed it the, when I, I first came into the industry around the kind of turn of the millennium. Um, I'd been in an internet training company that, that opportunistically got into e-learning and I was the head of marketing. So I had to write these brochures about our e-learning offering, which at the time was entirely vaporware. And we started going to uh, shows. We went to IT shows, which were all bald men with laptops um, and the, the stands were, were built like kind of medieval fortresses. And on the top tier, you would have a lot of um, models in Baco foil oh. mini skirts, go go dancing. Oh. Um, and, and it was, you know, it was outrageous. And, and then we kind of clocked on that we were going to the wrong shows. We should be going to HR and learning shows. So we started going to, to the learning shows and the HR shows. And overnight, I mean, but it completely changed. The stands all had leaves, rivers, streams on them. <laughs> Um, and all our leads, when we counted them up, they, they, were, they, they, they were between 60 and 70% women were coming to the stand. You know, none of the bald-headed men because they weren't IT. But HR and learning seemed to be dominated by, by women at that level. But when you slipped under the velvet rope and got into the VIP room, you know, I remember this CIPD conference going to, to this disco, and it was all these kind of the normal six-foot-five bald-headed blokes dad dancing who actually <laughs> ran the you know the hr directors and that you know so that's my anecdotal fleshing out of, of of the figures but that was 20 years ago has it changed has it got better since I, then? I think you bring up a really cool thing is um we call them in the states uh booth babes and I had started yep. uh, my career in marketing and um, for Home Shopping Network. And it was intriguing that <laughs> we were at a lot of events. I don't even know if in the um, late 80s, early 90s, if the, there was that uh, go-go dancing mini skirt set up. But it was definitely, there was a lot more women showcasing. And that was, that was horrible. There's other mm. stories about that um, that we talk about in yeah. the women and learning. Um, I was sent home for wearing pants, slacks to work yeah. um, from a company in Florida. And that is because I didn't have a dress on or I wasn't wearing pantyhose or a slit. I mean, like how degrading. So I think we have moved mm. from that. We've evolved. Um, I think when I just went to, I think it was a Salesforce conference, maybe just less than five years ago, three years ago, I saw the uniform dressed gals. Um, it was it was horrifying to see that Booth Babe concept come back. I don't, I think that's a, an output of the bad synergy of what's going on out there. I think. I, I love seeing a lot of the conferences that don't have the exhibition style, but where they do have it and where we're involved, I've not seen um, any of the booth babe type of stuff going on. So I hope we've evolved from mm -hmm. that. I think it all disgusts people. Um, the, the one time I did see it and there was a number of us that posted like, are you kidding? Not degrading the gals involved. That's not it. I mean, everybody needs to yeah. make an income and I'm sure they, there was a, an agenda to it and creativity I'm not against, but, um, and that's the other thing is no shaming of folks, but we got to get beyond this. Yeah. We're, we're professionals. Um, I think you're right. The under the velvet rope for the VIP, that too was shocking. Um, I went to an event and I think it was pointed out by a, a male L and D person saying, uh, I think there's only three women in this room. And mm. to me, that is completely unacceptable. Um, there should be the representation for diversity of thought. Um, and I do want to note that women of color have it even worse, mm. right? So their numbers are even more staggering than just women in learning. I mean, there is a problem in tech, which is the other industry that we're both part of here. You know, the learning technologies is kind of a 
hybrid thing and tech has its own problems. Well, I, th Do you see much I think it's stereotypical because there's a lot of, in, at least in North America, there's a lot of action with supporting girls and uh, women in STEM in the area of technology. Mm. And I think a great thing is the evolution of um, learning, going into e-learning, going into learning technologies and all the AI machine learning. More women, because there are more women in this industry are definitely becoming technologists if they're not already coming into it with that background. Personally, yeah. for me, I grew up uh, what we would have labeled a tomboy. I did much better. I took cal calculus for fun. I love analytics and technology. Writing the long story, mm. the you know journalism stereotype for females wasn't me. Um, I, English required English was a suffering for me to go through. So it was just that we were shy. It was not perceived as acceptable back in the stereotypical days. So my goal is with as us moving women in more senior roles that we start highlighting the women learning technologists. And I think there's a lot mm. more out there than are getting surfaced either because um, they're just kind of shy. I mean, typically, stereotypically, technology people aren't the show pieces that jump out there. They're usually more quiet, thoughtful, analytical, things like that, you know. But I, I believe mm. it's the stereotype that's having us think that, oh, well, now that learning is becoming so much more involved in technology, where is that going to leave women? Well, I think the numbers haven't shifted. There's just as many more women mm. coming in and having um, daughters in the range of that, I don't think they feel inhibited um, at all by that that technology mindset that it's typically all guys. I know exactly what you're referencing, though. Back in the day, the tech companies were heavy on that. Um, I know in North America, though, they've put a lot of effort um, and the universities, colleges, as well as in businesses to make sure we break that stereotype. And I hope that continues. As we move through this period of dealing with the effects of the global pandemic, uh, we're seeing research that seems to show that the impact of that is is falling harder on women, and we're hearing this uh, term, the female recession. Can you talk I, I about can. That? I'm I'm not 100 percent sure of what's going on, but I was shocked when I saw it, and I heard from, and this goes even beyond the learning and development industry, that um, some folks that I had worked with in previous organizations said their wives decided to stop working. Uh, the concept of they needed to put family first or juggle the children with education, um, if that's the case, and I have heard it happening, but you never know, it's like, am I looking for it now? Is it coming out? Then that's horrible. Um, and I'm seeing a few articles here and there. I'd put a shout out to people listening to this. Um, is this real? We just did a, a, a learning poll, hosted a, um, a conversation on women and learning. We had three bullets. Um, we tackled you know, um, how to develop others, the elevator going down and around. Um, also men as allies being huge, but then the female recession bullet never got tackled. So it was like the elephant in the room. Um, obviously those of us online weren't people that left our roles. So I'd love to get some, some global feedback on this. Is this really happening? Is this a media play? Is it propaganda for us to feel as though we're getting shifted back? But if it is real, what can we do about it to make sure that we're we're not losing great talent and we're not taking, um, you know, I, I brought this up before. If a, if a man comes in and he's got his kids around him, either in the office or online, it's like, oh, what a great dad. <laughs> wow. That's awesome. And if the moms are doing it, it's like, doesn't she have it together? Like what is going on? Why can't she just manage this? Um, even during COVID, we were all really considerate and it was all entertaining. I was sharing about my college daughters coming out while I'm doing something like this. I was horrified. Um, it's even riskier with college daughters. Um, but the feeling was that that weight was on me and I didn't see that happening to many of the gentlemen I was speaking to or interviewing or even my husband downstairs wasn't as worried about how the family was being represented. And um, once again, if a child, a dog, a pet came into their world, it was perceived as like, oh, wow, isn't that great? So awesome that mm. you can do it all. So I, I'd like to make sure we shift that attitude. That's something. And I'd love to be able to learn more about this female recession and speak to it later. Maybe you and I can chat about that on a hang yeah. 10. Okay. I will certainly take up that that invitation. Thank you. But there is a point there that you're absolutely right. You know, a man will do the washing up, but he wants a round of applause afterwards. And you know. <laughs> so could we talk a bit about your personal journey to where you are today? Uh, what's been most helpful to you in making your way as a woman in L&D? Uh, where have you encountered blockers, uh, be they negative attitudes from men or from women for that matter, or 
uh, bias or microaggressions, whatever else? How's um, it been? It's, it's been a journey. Um, I think just uh, being a uh, woman, not only in business, uh, in, in studies, in sport, it's been something that uh, I had to become resilient and comfortable with where you're plowing through. Um, I will say there was an informal research that I've done since 2013 that I think helped my journey is um, I would ask in the conferences how many women played sport, not Olympically, um, not super competitively, or maybe some that did. And every single time, it was a little bit less one year in the UK, but that's it. Um, everybody, like 90% of the women raised their hand that they had played sport. So I'm throwing that out there because I believe the resilience of, um, you know, keeping it on the field, having a different language based on whatever sports I've done many, you know, basketball, soccer, uh, softball, and recently in my later years, 20 on a uh, very competitive fencer, it definitely impacted the grit and resilience. And I think in my career, um, I was, you know, I had to start over leaving broadcast media, starting as an admin and go through. But what I was, and many people have stated that this was their success, um, many great CLO uh, women, Martha Soren, as, as well as many others said, be deliberate. Nothing was accidental. And, uh, you know, you do hear people say, I accidentally got into L and D, but when you, and, and it's almost, I don't know if it's imposter syndrome with women, but uh, it really wasn't accidental because once they got there, they had a strategy and they had a goal. So in traveling through many organizations, I was deliberate about, I want to do this. I want to do corporate learning. I want to be able to push the boundaries there. Um, knowing when you can leave and sometimes taking a risk, be a risk taker when it makes sense and don't beat yourself up if, if it doesn't work out. Um, I then was able to maneuver into roles where I, I could still educate myself. So um, if you're not passionate about learning and development, maybe this isn't for you. Find something you're passionate about. That has helped me. Um, mm. And then be careful because when you set your goals, you might get what you've set. And you may realize that uh, everyone else isn't as pleased. I think um, I've had conversations with other women who have, I was fortunate in 2018. Well, I wasn't fortunate. I worked hard for it. But um, being learning professional of the year. And I thought that was going to open so many doors. And actually, in the organization, it closed every door there was. And at that point, I knew this isn't going to go well. Um, I've talked to many other women that we were not even applying for it, but got top 50 L&D in America. Every single person, women I've spoken to, had to leave their organization. So but don't give up. Don't not, you know, I, I didn't even want to do the oh. after tape of like, where are you now? Because I just didn't want to send the wrong message. What that did is prepare me that I could be confident and go for a role. Like the role I have now at Learning Pool is, is I set it out on paper maybe a year and a half, two years ago. I talked to many organizations mm -hmm. and I was able to go to the organization that said, hey, we know you're a co-founder of Hashtag Women in Learning. That's yours. But we want you to continue the dialogue along with getting a job done. That is part of your job. Yeah. Um, this is it. And um, the innovative and creative mindset maybe didn't happen immediately when I thought I had achieved this great, you know, set goal that I had for myself, but it mm. does come. So don't give up. Be clear that what you perceive as success is your success and you own it. And just be aware that others might not see it that way. Um, one last thing is I've had many men sponsors, mentors, and allies throughout my my career. They have been amazing. And I don't think I would have elevated to the roles of VP or senior roles without them. However, it was some of the women that really went and shined. There was a fewer, a lot fewer, sadly, but said, hey, if you want to get to go to conferences, start presenting at them. That was one L&D uh, woman, maybe 18 years ago, 15 years ago, other women showing you haven't done a white paper, you know, you're in a regulatory, write a white paper, that's going to help everything these key female executives, leaders, or colleagues shared with me, definitely got the push along with the um, sponsorship that you need in the company. So great mentors, mm -hmm. key component is a sponsor, sponsors are different, and that's what you really need to succeed in an organization. And then being at the right place and setting your goal as to what that looks like. Experience. It's everything that ever happened to you, everything that ever will. Experiences both huge and not so huge. 
slowly add up over a lifetime to become your experience. Everything you know, everything you are. Experience. And now the experience word is taking over learning. Learning experience. Our uh, learning experience. Learning experience design. Learning experiences. In some worry that the change will distract from what science has told us about how people learn. Do we even know what we mean by the words learning experience? I've talked to some incredibly smart designers, theoreticians, L&D practitioners and technologists on behalf of the good people at Learning. And together we've created a series of guides and resources to help you get the best from this change. Download the first of these now, the Experience White Paper. Experience. So you mentioned winning, um, was it Global Learning Professional of the Year there, and that wasn't a, a career step up, it was a, a career blocker. How does that work? What, what do you think is going on there? Oh, gosh, well, I don't want to get myself in trouble. Um, it, was, it was shocking to me. Um, it was, I, I aspired for it and I worked, it took many years. The one thing I'll, I'll put out there is if you haven't applied for corporate um, mm. awards, you learn so much by losing. <laughs> Tell me so about it. not losing, but not by, you just, you educate yourself. Wow. You get to see, you aspire to what you're seeing out there. Um, and then you set your own personal goals in regard to what you think mm. you would want. It, um, it was tough because uh, it wasn't, there was a lot of reorgs, reorgs happen. And um, sometimes you get folks in learning and development that aren't aspiring learning mm. and development folks. Um, and it doesn't always work out if they're not seeing that as a success or they don't value it. And this goes to a bigger problem is valuing our career and learning and development as mm. a profession. We need to say we're not just sliding through. And it's great when people from other businesses and industries come into L&D, but we also need to shine and highlight those that excel in learning and development. And they committed to this. They were deliberate in their career to say, I am proud to be in learning development or sales enablement or any of those things. It shouldn't be that it's on a stepping stool to go someplace else. This should be like no other profession does it. They have certifications in engineering. They have in technology, portfolio managers need to get, you know, all these series sevens and other financial mm. accomplishments. In learning and development, we should be proud of what we've done because when it's done really well, we move the business and we move the needle. A while back, a lot of women I knew were getting excited about the Lean In book by Sheryl Sandberg of Facebook, and she wrote with Nell Scavell. She had a co-writer. But it's been criticised since for offering a sort of trickle-down feminism, providing a guide for how to succeed within the bias system rather than making any attempts at, at changing that system. What's your view on that? This is so funny. I can't believe you asked this. Um, I didn't plan for this, but sorry. I'm coming right back because... Um, I have the book right here. I just brought oh, it wow. in. It was monumental um, right here. And in it, yes. you see, I have notes and signatures. So I won't bash another woman because I think that's part of like all the signatures here. Um, it was oh. the first time on November 5th, 2013, that I delivered the topic of women and learning at Elliott Macy's Learning Conference. And I went uh -huh. through this and I wanted to love this book. I didn't agree with the approach, but what I love and I will support is she stepped up and she made it a conversation. She made it something yeah. that we could talk about. Um, I, I think in here it references her going to university for the MRS degree. I don't know if what you, you know what that is. No, MRS? What's yeah, that? Mrs to get married. Oh, right. <laughs> like that's an 80s concept. So, but hey, well, however Sorry, it goes, slow. It, yeah. it gave a strategy that worked for someone and it brought it to the table. I then discovered, and I had everyone in that first session because I knew it was going to be monumental in 2013. Um, I asked them to sign it. I said, I'll never forget this. Will you please all sign it? Um, because mm. this book and this conversation came about and I knew it was going to, you just feel it. So if you feel something, don't, don't not acknowledge it. And then another book came out, The Orange Line. But this was a woman's guide to integrating career, family, and life. I don't think I've ever seen a man's book. Well, all books are men's book, I suppose, is the, you know, the counter to that. <laughs> um, I read through it in 2015 or so and was blown away and the authors, I was like, wow, one's from here. 
So we speed up to most recently, and I bring this up because it's a completely different design of a book. It gives grids, it gives the solution as to what to do about like where we self-select out what you might be thinking. Um, there's also an orange line as a, as a train line here in Boston. And uh, a woman I'd worked with 15, 20 years ago, we reach out and she's re-exploring her career options, uh, Nancy Carlson. And she said, oh, the orange line, I know Jody. I know Jody. Let me introduce you. Blow, blew my mind, kind of like talking to you. Like this is a, a person and a name I, I've heard about. And um, we now are able to connect and talk to this woman, Jody. Um, her last name is D-E-T-J-E-N. And she, with other authors, just wrote another book, The Next Smart Step with the Boston accent, it just occurred to me. I didn't clean that one up, but it's an amazing book once again to say man or woman moving along, but hers is focused quite a bit on uh, the statistics and details in regard to that. So I'll try to have you get in touch with that. That to me has evolved. We start with a book like Lean In and um, I'm an athlete, so I would say Lean In. I want to box out. The heck with that. I'm <laughs> boxing you out. I'm, I'm going to get the rebound. I'm not a great shooter, but a pretty good defender. Um, and we went from lean in the orange line to now the next smart step. So what can women do about the situation? I'm going to come to what part men play in, in, in this, but what can women do to change the situation to make things better? First off, um, think about how they're creating their own elevator, developing others, bringing others into the fold. Um, start talking about it. Don't feel as though, if anything, um, and there's still women out there in business and in learning and development that think it's just them. They see so many female managers or um, frontline workers, frontline managers like that, all being women. They figure they're not making it to the top because they're not good enough. And I will say, had I not... Um, invested time in multiple awards and educating myself on what great looks like, I would feel like I'm not good enough. I can't do it. It's not like one plus one, you know, synergistically equals greater than two. It's this really takes time to build confidence, understanding in yourself, um, reaching out to others. Um, there's a hashtag women and learning LinkedIn group that just gets more yep. conversation, reach out to folks like myself or other thought leaders in the industry to figure out where, what, when, and how. Remember that men as your allies will definitely be a great step. And don't be too shy to, and if you get knocked down by people, just pick yourself up. Um, that's the resilience and the grit it's gonna take. Make sure you're doing something, whether it be learning or not, that you're passionate about. I forget there was a great quote. I always mess them up, but like you can end up doing a career in anything. So why not make it one that you love and that you're passionate about? If you're going to succeed or fail, you might as well do it in something that means the most to you. If you are passionate about learning, don't let anyone, anyone tell you that you're not good enough or that you can't do it. I've had some great engagement with alumni from 30 under 30 or 30 under 30s coming through. Um, mm. Annalyn, um, Megan Castillo, many other folks that's important that we support, but what's come up recently, and I think this is a big turning point for women in learning, is there's women that are still out there and they don't want to leave their career. So after mm -hmm. they've had the children, the juggle, you think that like you're going to go crazy with all that, then you feel like you're done. So they've kind of used you up when there's been, this has been written about when women are in the childbearing ages, they're just almost grateful to be able to still work, that they usually work for lower wage. They usually work around the clock. And then when you mm -hmm. get beyond that and you're like, okay, I've hit the pinnacle, um, you know, in the middle of my, my top of my game right there, they're like, oh no, we'll get that other woman who's younger and can just wheel through it. Now it probably happens with men as well in different stages, mm -hmm. but I think this female recession might be even tied into this is in this upper arch of our career, we need to start acknowledging and helping. Um, maybe we pick up golf, the networking came up quite a bit, go for drinks or something like that. It doesn't have to be alcoholic if you don't drink, but you need to get yourself out there and you can't be shy about it. And even um, we've had Sonia Malik from IBM say, be fearless, be courageous. And that goes for the 30 over 30 or <laughs> 60 over 60 or whatever that is. We now need to support the longevity of women in learning and longevity of the profession being perceived as the expertise that's needed in the industry.
So an interesting piece of advice there, take up golf. Um, when I first got into the learning industry, I remember being in a, uh, in a, in a meeting with uh, a platform salesman and they sold very big enterprise level uh, learning management systems, which just going, just beginning to kind of become a big market at the time. And he said, you've got to face this. Um, most learning management systems are bought on a golf course. Wow. Um, and I thought, well, you know, where does that leave women? <laughs> uh, there's not, there's, and in the States, where did they open first after COVID? Um, golf and gun shops. Yeah. <laughs> what? Yeah, we, um, well, but we had that over here, a special dispensation for people who run grouse moors and stuff like it's that. It's crazy. But you bring up a session. good thing about the whole golf thing is I can remember being stated to my, my journey here. Um, I worked with a, a group of CEOs um, over in Ireland. And at one point I said, can I join you guys? You guys go golfing. They were all, it was great. It was like the Irish Learning Alliance competitors all went and they played golf and they said, oh, Sharon, that might be the worst thing for your career because you're going to try to beat them all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. Of course I am. I can play a good game. Um, yeah. And this weekend, funny enough, I'm going up to New Hampshire. She won the match, but she lost the sale. She yeah. lost the sale. She got to. Um, I've had that happen a couple of times. I was interviewing with some companies that were all male, except for what you were saying before, like to junior level. And um, in the dinner where I, it was really my job to lose... <laughs> I, yeah. I actually brought up and said, you're completely wrong. In this sport you do, it was about basketball or soccer, which I coached. And yeah. <laughs> right then I sealed the deal. I remember getting the Uber afterwards back and the other guy goes, it's okay. You'll find something else somewhere. <laughs> I was just like, all because I actually corrected the six other men and their approach to a sport and a dinner. Yeah, so yeah. at that point, and um, this was the years ago, I decided not to do dinners included in interviews. <laughs> it yeah, was yeah. crazy. What should men do in this? I mean, I, I think the men as allies tag is, is really good because I think in a way men need to be given permission. I mean, they, obviously they're not shrinking violets, but they need to kind of be in permission that they are part of, of that debate. But I think there is a, a, always a problem that men don't know where to place their voice. Even if they're kind of on side, they don't know where their voice sits in this thing. Because as soon as, as a man starts to talk, two things happen. One is that he's mansplaining feminism <laughs> to people, which, do, which isn't a good look. And, and the other one, it's like, you know, you, you kind of seize the microphone. Um, and, and that feels wrong as well. So I, I, I kind of sense men who'd like to do something not knowing where their voice should be in this. I mean, it, it seems to me like the, it, the answer should be that it's a conversation. But what advice would you give men who, who really want to help but don't want to kind of go in with their size nines and sort of um, blunder? Um, I'd say it's beyond... Uh, conversation. First off, I want to acknowledge, um, I think in this situation with women and learning, men um, historically have done more than women helping other women get places. So um, every panel I've led, every single woman has said, it's not been a man that's been in the way, it's been another woman. So with that being right. said, we need to get beyond that and acknowledge that, you know, we just did our conversation. It was I think a fifth of the attendees were men and the people that showed up in person, three other men, because we kept it really big online with like 40 yeah. and then they were all men as well. So um, it's moved into action mode and um, men that are really supportive of, of allies support the concept of learning and organization. And then um, they hire and promote and accelerate women in their careers a lot, as well as the women doing with each other. So until we can get it that we're all feeling equally balanced um, and that they're actually getting women to an opportunity time for them to illustrate what they're doing. Uh, one great example is Clint Clarkson was on the same panel as we did How to Accelerate Your L&D Career. It was, a, um, it was almost like a charity one on Mother's Day in the States, May 9th, just this year clearly one of the funnest. I had mimosas at the end. I couldn't do it before. I made it look like I was having them, but I couldn't. Um, I was too afraid to get confused. Um, it was fabulous dialogue. It went 30 minutes over on the hour because people were so engaged and I'd never seen that happen in a, an hour long webinar. It was amazing to see Clint's honesty. He's like, hey, I've, I thought 
I thought women liked X, Y, Z. Um, and it was okay that we could banter. So truthful yeah. conversation and then action supporting that. And his action was he had four of us ladies chatting with a number of men and women out there on accelerating your career. And we were really able to pinpoint some of the misconceptions and some of the stereotypes that go along with women in learning. So where next for Women in L&D? What should people look out for in terms of upcoming events that you're running, um, apart from me being on Hang 10, of course? Yes. And what's the best place for people to go if they want to keep up with your activities? Well, I think the um, hashtag Women in Learning LinkedIn group, uh, I want to acknowledge Kate Graham, who is amazing. If you don't know her, please look her up there. She has co-founded that hashtag so that we could all keep the dialogue straight. And until that had happened, there'd be a lot of great conversation like this and a big uptake, and then people wouldn't know where to go. Um, I know many organizations are doing women in learning, and we're definitely co considering doing another hybrid event with the author from the next smart step with Jody here at Learning Pool. We'll be doing it hybrid, so it's virtual as well as in person. I'll get you some mm -hmm. of those dates. And just keeping an eye out for what's going on. There's so many things in the industry that are happening. And I would say it shouldn't have to cost much money. I mean, yes, value ourselves as women. And when we're doing something, we should get paid as well as any man or whomever. But in regard to this topic and needing support, um, that should be something we should just be doing and developing each other. So feel free to reach out to myself, um, Kate, or just look at that hashtag link, hashtag women and learning on LinkedIn. And that might be able to direct you to the multiple events. It is starting to get uh, pick up. I'm hoping to get it at as many learning conferences, virtual or in person, someday we'll have them back in person as well as online. Um, but yeah, keep, keep an eye out. I don't know of any big event coming up, but I think that's the beauty in it. It should be sprinkled along and it should be mm -hmm. embedded within all that we do is just keeping that mindset and helping to uh, move the needle. A little and often. Yeah. Good luck with it. Uh, we'll yeah. put anything you can send me, we'll put in the show notes uh, for people. So. Thank you very much for that, Sharon. I'm, I'm sure we could talk uh, about twice the time at this about this. It's a very engaging topic, and you've been a very engaging guest. Thanks a lot for doing it. Uh, thank you so much. Take care. That's all on the Learning Hack podcast for this time. Many thanks to Sharon and to our sponsors, Learning Pool. The Learning Hack is completely independent and transparently funded by sponsorship. Please subscribe on your podcast platform of choice or on YouTube. You can reach us at John Helmer on Twitter or through the website johnhelmerconsulting.com. Next time, our Women First theme continues. We're featuring an exclusive interview with the female CEO of Learning Technology's brightest new startup. It's bad to the bone. That's B-A-D, standing for best of digital. And it's helmed by the diva of disruption, the absolute avatar of agile leadership, Andrea Miles. Now I finally get it. So I hate to ask this, but that maybe it's important to ask, but has that seen actual action in the ocean, that boogie board? This one, oh, absolutely. Yeah. I am the world's, like, I, uh, what year did 2000 and uh, maybe 12 years ago, we brought it, we had these little Cape Cod, I'm from Massachusetts. Yeah. So we had little Cape Cod book because I love to body surf. Hmm. And um we went running out in the Outer Banks, which is off of North Carolina and much bigger waves. Mm -hmm. And literally, I was there with four girls. We went a couple of families. And I'm like, I'm in charge. Like, I'm the <laughs> adult that acts. And bam, our boards broke. Oh, no. We, it was like, and we're pretty experienced ocean people, mm -hmm. but it was an education. Like, so we all went, we got Outer Banks boards. There's two more at home, so I can still do my chats. And these, you have this.